All right, so let's dive into getting Google to love your website. We have a ton of material to, to cover. I'm not going to be able to go into uh, a, a lot of detail in, in one hour. I'm going to you know, kind of gloss over some topics and uh, go over uh, some in, in some detail, but we're going to have to uh, really keep it fast moving. Now, uh, if you're going to take copious notes, I encourage you to do that. That will help you to retain the information. But do bear in mind, in addition to the uh, recording being made and, and will, will be available to you, uh, as Yamina said, I'm also going to make my PowerPoint slides available to uh, you folks. If you stick around to the end of the, the, the webinar, I will give you information on how to request the uh, PowerPoint deck from me. So uh, with that, uh, so who am I? Why should I be the one to speak to you about SEO and not somebody else? Well. Uh, I'm co-author of The Art of SEO and author of uh, Google Power Search. Uh, also, I founded an SEO agency called Net Concepts uh, back in the 90s, sold it to a company called Covario out of San Diego last year. Uh, just, you know, just a bit of trivia here. I lived in New Zealand for almost eight years, um, returning back to the U.S. in 2007. Decided to test the theory that you can live and work anywhere when you're, you're on the Internet. So uh, it actually does work. It was an amazing time. I invented a platform for SEO called Gra Gravity Stream, which actually is now part of Covario's suite of offerings. And uh, I'm currently a free agent uh, developing an SEO coaching program, which I hope to launch uh, in, in the relatively near future. So uh, here's a cover of uh, The Art of SEO and of, uh, of Google Power Search. Google Power Search is not an SEO book per se. It's a book about how to find anything on Google. And I uh, actually gave a, an O'Reilly webinar uh, a couple months ago about power searching techniques, how to find anything in Google. Uh, that was pretty good. So uh, feel free to watch the archives of that one if, if that interests you. You know, I, I like to just kind of make sure that we're all on the same page here. We are going to get somewhat advanced during the course of this, uh, this webinar. But uh, just so we're all on the same page, uh, I just wanted to differentiate the uh, paid results or the advertising, Google AdWords advertising, from the organic or natural or al algorithmic results. Right? So all those are synonyms, organic results, or organic uh, SEO, natural results, natural SEO, and, and so forth. So those are just different terminologies for the concept that you're getting you know, quote unquote free traffic from Google. It's not really free in the sense that you actually have to work for it. Uh, you're not going to just get uh, great rankings just by you know, showing up on the web. You have to actually put some effort into it. But uh, that's what we're going to talk about in the next few minutes. So I like to like first just build a business case for SEO. If you're going to invest a lot of time and energy and, and money in, in terms of uh, internal uh, staff time and, and uh, consulting uh, uh, resources, you know, hiring folks and so forth, you need to know what, what you're leaving on the table currently by not having a fully optimized website. And so I uh, have this formula, which I will uh, display here next, which takes in, into account that uh, if you have, let's say, a whole bunch of different keywords that you're targeting, if you look at each keyword individually and then run this formula through where you take the number of people searching for those keywords, and we'll talk about how to find that number out in a minute, uh, multiply that by the search engine's market share, and with Google, it could be anywhere from 65 to 70 percent, um, depending on the study, and multiply that by the expected click-through rate from the search results and being, let's say, number two, you might expect 10, 12 percent click-through rate. Uh, you know, if you're number one, maybe 40 percent click-through rate, depending on what else is uh, up near the top, how many paid ads there are, and so forth. Multiply the uh, number there by the average conversion rate on your website, and then multiply that by the average transaction amount or average order value. You'll get a number that's just for that one keyword, and then you run this formula across all the different keywords that you're targeting and uh, add all the numbers up. So that's the, uh, that, that's the approach that I would say gives you a, a rough, very rough ballpark on uh, your missed opportunity cost. And 
the way I like to think of your your uh, search engine listings in Google is it's like your virtual sales force. So every page of your site is a virtual salesperson. If you have a 50-page website, well, that's only 50 virtual salespeople, whereas if you had, let's say, a 500-page uh, website or even a 5,000-page website, you'd be in much better shape. It gives you a lot more opportunities to uh, target different keywords and go after different keyword markets. So uh, I'm, there are caveats here, of course. If you have uh, a lot of duplicate content or low-quality content, then having a lot of pages in Google's index isn't necessarily a good thing. But you know, all, all other things being equal, if you have more content, more valuable content that's in Google's big database and in their index, then that's a good thing. So uh, and and. If you do it right, you can actually make money while you sleep, and that's where, like, uh, um, for example, I, I have uh, three daughters, and one of them has a website that uh, ranks really well for the term Neopets, which is a, a fairly popular um, website owned by Nickelodeon, the television network, and she ranks in the top ten for the term Neopets. She has a, a, a game cheat site of, uh, relating to Neopets, a fan site. Right? neopetsfanatic.com. So she makes money while she sleeps with Google AdSense ads. When people click on the Google ads that are presented on her website, uh, she gets a share of or percentage of, uh, of the revenue that Google takes in for that advertising. So it really is money while you sleep, and it's child's play. Even uh, a kid can do it. My daughter started when she was 13, so uh, you can too, right? So. Um, Let's uh, look at kind of what the market uh, share of the search engines look like. We, I, I mentioned Google has, uh, depending on the study, 65 to 70 uh, percent. According to uh, Comscore, uh, recent Comscore data, Google is at 66 percent, and uh, Yahoo, which is powered by Bing, uh, by Microsoft's Bing technology, 15 percent, and Bing itself at about 15% as well. So what's curious though, or I think fascinating, it's an amazing opportunity, is actually those aren't, uh, the, the, the Yahoo and Bing search engines aren't really like number two and number three when you think about it. YouTube is a search engine, right? So even though it's also a, a social network and it's a video sharing site, it's also a search engine. And by query volume, by the number of searches done, it's number two in popularity. So it's not Yahoo, it's Bing. I mean, it's, it's not Bing, it's, it's YouTube that is the number two search engine. So if you don't have uh, uh, compelling video content hosting, hosted in, in YouTube, you're really missing out. It's an amazing opportunity. And, that's that's a, a topic for a whole other webinar. So stay tuned. Maybe I'll, I'll do a, a webinar on, on YouTube optimization at, at a later point. So uh, let's get back to Google SEO specifically, and um, you know all the stuff that I'm talking to you about in the course of this hour is really relevant not only to Google but also to Bing and, and to Yahoo by default, of course being uh, powered by Bing, uh, whatever you do that helps your Bing rankings will help your YouTube ranking, I mean your um, uh, Yahoo rankings as well. So uh, you know, bear that in mind that what you're doing to optimize your website is going to uh, benefit you not only in Google but across all the major engines and uh, over time it's not just a, you know, fix it uh, and, and now you've got to go back and fix it again in another week sort of thing. Once you fix these issues relating to stuff like we'll talk about duplicate content and canonicalization and other really geeky things as well as writing good uh, compelling uh, keyword rich body copy and, and page titles and, and a bunch of stuff, right? So all that sort of stuff is going to benefit you long term. It will continue to uh, pay dividends months and months and even years into the future. So we've got to start, though, with keywords, because if we don't target the right keywords, all of our efforts are going to be in vain. Right? So we need to identify keywords that are not only relevant to our business or our organization, but also popular with searchers. These are keywords that your, 
your, your visitors, your potential visitors, are, are typing into the search engine. So if, if there's a disconnect there, if you're not using the terminology that they're using, you're not going to get the traffic. So think of it this way, like if, um, you know, intuitively, what would be the, the, uh, the right answer here? Is, are people searching for digital camera in singular, or are they searching for in plural, digital cameras? And intuitively, you might say it's, it's the plural. Uh, that's what I would say if I had to guess. That's why you need to use the tools, and which we'll talk about in just a moment, to, to determine what the real answer is. And in this case, it's actually the singular. There are more searches by almost, this is like a factor of two, uh, more uh, Google searches for the keyword digital camera singular than digital cameras in plural. It's pretty fascinating. So how are we going to figure this out? How are we going to actually identify what the different verb tenses are, singular, plural, uh, misspellings even, for, uh, synonyms? What are the right words that people are using? Are they, are they using the word hooded sweatshirt? Are they using the word hoodie? Yeah, so we need to identify this. That's where these keyword research tools come in. And the good news here is a lot of these tools are free. So um, there's really no excuse to not use these tools. So I break them into two categories. There's the keyword brainstorming tools, which will help you identify kind of a seed list of, of keywords and kind of the markets you want to target. And then there's the tools that will help you actually check the, the actual popularity data, the numbers of, of searchers and uh, searches for different keywords. And the tools would include like uh, Keyword Discovery, Word Tracker, the Google AdWords Keyword Tool, Google Trends, Google Insights for Search. And we're going to have a quick look through each of these different tools. And then we'll go into the seven steps to uh, higher rankings once you've identified the keywords that you want to target. So that's uh, kind of the layout for the next uh, uh, 45 minutes. So if we uh, start with uh, keyword brainstorming tools, uh, Quintura is a, is a free uh, uh, kind of cool little tool. You just type in a keyword, and then it gives you this cloud-like uh, thing over on the left-hand side, which it displays the, uh, uh, some related uh, terms right? and, and how, the, how these terms are related. So it will give you an idea what sort of other keywords you might want to target. Um, another tool which I'm sure you're familiar with. It's built into the, the Google homepage and, and uh, Google toolbar and um, most of the uh, Google search um, uh, widgets and things in the web browsers is Google Suggest. So as you start typing keystrokes, it will um, auto-complete and give you suggestions of popular keywords. This, uh, bear in mind that the suggestions are personalized to your location. So it's not just uh, raw popularity data that this um, uh, Google Suggest tool is powered by, but it's nonetheless pretty darn cool, right? So uh, my daughter's website, uh, the Neopets Fanatic site, she could start keyword brainstorming around what sorts of keywords she might want to target. Like uh, she starts typing in the keyword Neopets and sees that uh, Neopets avatars is popular, Neo Neopets cheats is very popular, um, uh, Neopets uh, Wiki and Neopets Jelly World and so forth, right? So who would have thought, right? You, you, you need to use tools like this in order to identify the opportunities so you can start building content around them. So you're not going to get any search volume data from Google Suggest or from these other keyword brainstorming tools. That's where the actual keyword research tools like the Google AdWords keyword tool come into play. But right now we're just brainstorming. Right. So um, what uh, um, you, you may have also uh, gotten some familiarity with already is uh, the Yahoo Search Assist tool. So if you ever use Yahoo, it will also give you search suggestions, keyword suggestions, as you start typing keystrokes, just like Google Suggest does. And uh, it uh, is also, uh, I think, a pretty useful tool to, to brainstorm. Now, I'm going to tell you my favorite tool for keyword brainstorming is, by far is Suvel. 
It's S O O V L E dot com, and uh, it's it's just amazing. What it does is it auto completes as you type your keystrokes, and it pulls from Google Suggest, from Yahoo Search Assist, from Bing, from YouTube, uh, Wikipedia, Amazon, and Answers dot com all in real time. So as you're typing your keystrokes, it is pulling in suggestions from all of those tools simultaneously. That's pretty cool. So if you want to wow your friends or your boss or whatever, just pull up Suval and show them this tool and start typing, and uh, they'll be impressed. Right? So I'm going to start typing the, the letter B, um, and then I start getting suggestions uh, filled in here of uh, different keywords that are popular. And, and recommended by Wikipedia, by Amazon, et cetera. Isn't that cool? And so if I continue to, st to type, if I t finish typing the word baby, um, and okay, so let me give you a quick anecdote here. Let's say that I'm a baby furniture manufacturer. I sell bassinets and cribs and so forth, right? And I wanted to do some keyword brainstorming. It could be quite instructive to use a keyword brainstorming tool here like Suval and find that, lo and behold, baby names is super popular according to Google, Bing, and Yahoo. Uh, all three of those suggestion tools put baby names way up at the top of the list, right? So I wasn't thinking baby names because I don't sell baby names. I sell bassinets and cribs and so forth. Why would I, uh, what would I do with this information, this new information that baby names is like super popular? Well, this is your target market, right, who are searching for baby names because they're expecting parents probably. So if you offered an area on your site targeted to baby names and related uh, secondary level terms like uh, baby name definitions and baby name meanings and baby name trends and uh, overused baby names and unusual baby names, et cetera, et cetera, right, and create a whole section of your site around those different keywords relating to baby names, you can start getting this traffic in for um, these different keywords like baby name meanings potentially and so forth, even if you can't get on uh, page one for baby names by itself, at least you could potentially stand a chance to rank on, on page one for some of these secondary terms like baby name meanings, right? And of course, these are expectant parents, and you can then do a soft sell once they're at your site getting this valuable content. Say, okay, well, you know, would you like a free guide to, you know, nesting and getting everything ready, uh, getting the baby's room ready, you know, have a, this essential checklist of everything that you need uh, f for your baby's, uh, your new baby's room, right? And all you have to do is supply your email address. That's a compelling offer, and uh, what a, a fantastic opportunity. You wouldn't have even thought of, potentially, unless you started using these keyword brainstorming tools and kind of identified that opportunity around baby names. Okay, so that's keyword brainstorming. Now let's move into the keyword research tools that will give us real numbers. Uh, we'll start with Word Tracker. There's a free trial to Word Tracker, but it is a paid tool. Um, it's based on uh, data from two very minor search engines, uh, which you may or may not have even heard of, Metacrawler and Dogpile. <laughs> so, you know, it's like uh, that's a fraction of a percent of the total uh, search um, marketplace. So it's not like uh, uh, this is hugely statistically significant data, but it's still a pretty instructive to have access to multiple tools, so that's why I do mention Word Tracker as a, as a tool to, to look into. Um, it's, it's relatively inexpensive. So, um, And we have Keyword Discovery, which um, I also uh, like. It's, it's a, an, again, a paid tool, and uh, it's based on a, a, a larger swath of data so, you know, there's more statistical significance in it, but it's not based on all Google search data. That's, uh, we'll come to some Google tools in a minute that will give us actual Google search volumes. But, um, um, yeah, I, I, I do like keyword discovery as well. So um, between keyword discovery and, and word tracker, if I had to choose, uh, oh, don't make me choose. Okay, but they're roughly about the same price, okay? 
And then we have, and, and one thing about keyword discovery that I really like that Word Tracker doesn't have is the historical trending over time. So you could see, for example, seasonality and, and the, like say the term digital cameras, it, of course it peaks during the holiday season, right? So you get a lot more searches for digital camera or digital cameras in the months, uh, uh, the, the last months of the year leading up to Christmas. All right, so that's um, keyword discovery. And then uh, next up, I want to tell you about the Google AdWords keyword tool, which is uh, an essential tool. It's free, so you can't beat the price. And if you're not using the Google AdWords keyword tool, you're really missing out. Now, one thing I will point out that's a, it's critical that you do if you use the Google AdWords keyword tool for SEO, for researching keyword volumes for SEO purposes, is turn off the default mode of broad match in the tool and turn on exact match. I'll show you exactly how to do that in just a moment, but that is critically important because otherwise all the data you're getting back is like bogus. The numbers are so over, massively overinflated, it's, it's not even funny. So uh, do remember to do that or this tool is kind of useless for, for SEO. Um, and, and another thing too that I think is important to bear in mind is you can get the historical trending over time just like keyword discovery provides with the uh, you know, historical trending, seasonality stuff, right? In order to get that data, you need to be logged into your Google AdWords account. And uh, if you're just coming in as uh, an anonymous user to the Google AdWords keyword tool, you can still get data out of it, but you're not going to get the historical trending graph. Okay, so let's see how to turn off broad match and turn on exact match. And if I had the time, I would explain what broad match and phrase match and exact match mean, uh, but that's kind of more relevant to the uh, paid search advertising side of things, but I don't have the time, so we're going to skip over that. Just trust me on this. Untick the one box and tick the other box, uh, and, and you'll get good data, right? So you see over in the left-hand column, there's the match types, and then it's uh, by default set to, to broad match, so that's ticked and nothing else is ticked. So um, in this uh, example, I've uh, you can see I searched for the word blog, and I'm getting like 150 whatever million uh, search re uh, um, searches according to this tool for the term blog uh, globally across you know, the planet every month on average. That's crazy. It's not that number. It's not even close to that number. There are not 151 million people or 151 million searches happening for the word blog all across the planet on, on a monthly basis. Nope. So let's turn off broad match, so we're going to untick that box, and then we're going to tick exact. And watch what happens to the numbers. The, the number of searches for the word blog drops to uh, just uh, a little over 2 million. Wow, what a difference. So that's the real number of searches, because otherwise, where'd they get the 151 million? Well, they added in uh, searches for things like how to start a blog, how to blog, uh, how to market a blog, blog marketing, um, blog, uh, you know, blog for dummies, you know, all the sort of stuff that people are searching for that has the word blog in it, or you know, uh, uh, even potentially a, a synonym or misspelling of it. And then Google adds all of those numbers together, and that gives you the 151 million. That is not useful for SEO. That's only useful and maybe even semi-useful for paid search advertising if you're doing Google AdWords. It's not useful for SEO, so remember to do this. Okay, so moving off of the Google AdWords keyword tool and then on to another free Google tool called Google Trends. Now this tool is a bit more simplistic because you're not getting uh, a lot of uh, uh, charts of, of, of numbers, and, and uh, by the way, you can export the, those numbers into an Excel spreadsheet and stuff. Um, most keyword research tools allow you to do that sort of thing nowadays, so uh, that's really useful to start crunching through stuff uh, in an Excel spreadsheet. 
But this is Google Trends. You can see from the screenshot here, I've uh, compared digital camera to digital cameras, and uh, lo and behold, the singular is, as I said, way more popular. That's in red compared with the blue line, which is the, uh, uh, the plural. And uh, you can um, you know, change the, the, the date range, and it correlates peaks and valleys in the graphs to different uh, news events and so forth. It's a pretty cool little free tool. Then you have the uh, uh, Google Insights for Search tool which is, again, free. Uh, thank you, Google. And this tool is uh, also giving you a, a graph just like Google Trends, but it also gives you some interesting um, other uh, charts and, and, and graphs, like it shows uh, a world map and then uh, shows which countries uh, uh, you know, search for the keyword more frequently than, than other countries, and then that shows top uh, searches, related searches, and then rising searches, so related keywords to the one that you put in, or um, in this case I put in a couple of different uh, keywords. So it's looking for related terms that are um, uh, quickly rising in popularity and then uh, showing those. So you could see, oh, here's a new trend that I didn't even pick up on that I should probably write about. All right, so that is uh, keyword research, and now we're going to go into the seven steps to get your your website really humming from an SEO standpoint, so it, it just crushes it in Google. And uh, these seven steps are getting your site fully indexed, getting your pages visible, building links, and thus page rank. Page rank. I'll talk to you in a minute about what that means. Leveraging your page rank is number four. Encouraging click through from the search results to your site. That's number five. And then number six, tracking the right metrics. And number seven, following best practices. So that's uh, the seven steps, and we're going to go through each one, starting with how to get fully indexed. And, and Google's index is just a huge database, and uh, they have data centers all over the planet, and the, the uh, database is replicated across these different data centers. And I won't go into any more detail than that about the, uh, the, the plumbing of how this all works, but um, suffice it to say that you want to get all your pages in Google's database. If you don't, then you're missing out. So. Um, you can't rank if you your page cannot rank if it's not in Google's database, right? If it's not in the index, it's not going to rank. So um, I, I mentioned that there's this thing called page rank, which relates to how um, how Google sees your website in terms of importance, and it relates to your link importance or, or your link popularity. So I'll, I'll get into more detail about that when I talk about uh, step four and, and building page rank and, and link authority. But suffice it to say that if you have more link authority and more page rank, you're going to get um, uh, more love from Google, not just in terms of better rankings, but also Google bot, the, the, the spider or crawler that explores your website and follows all the links, will crawl deeper and more frequently um, through your website if you have higher page rank. So build more links is the bottom line there. Also, you can check your index, page, uh, index pages, the, what of your website is in Google's database using Google Webmaster Tools and or the site colon query. Uh, or a query operator in Google. So you type in site colon www dot whatever your website domain is dot com, right? So site colon www dot microsoft dot com would show you uh, pages of of the Microsoft website that are in in Google's index. And just bear in mind that the page number estimates that you're going to get. Uh, so it's going to say there are 3 million results from Microsoft.com or whatever, and that's a really rough, rough estimate. And it's probably wildly inaccurate, so don't bet your life on it. Just, you know, it's better than having no data. You're go you'll get better data out of Google Webmaster Tools. 
So uh, definitely uh, sign up for Webmaster Tools if you haven't already. It's free, and they'll give you all sorts of data about their crawling of your website, and, and if they find duplicate content issues, they'll give you all these great reports and so forth. And you just need to verify that you're a, a site owner, and you get multiple site owners of, of the website. So uh, it, it's just a, an essential tool, so definitely sign up for that. So if you have uh, poor indexation, you could actually have too much indexation. In other words, you have duplicate content, a lot of pages getting in indexed that really shouldn't be because they are basically the same content over and over and over again, and Google doesn't figure that out. And We'll, we'll look at an example in just a moment of, of that. But uh, it can definitely cause you lots of headaches to have um, a duplicate or repeated content over and over again in, in Google's database. Indexation challenges will typically stem from things like overly complex URLs that are like a mile long and have lots of ampersands and equal signs in them, uh, content duplication across multiple pages of your site, cannibalization uh, where uh, you, you basically you have page rank dilution happening if you have multiple pages that are the same content but at differing URLs because uh, instead of having all the links pointing to one definitive URL, it gets split up across whatever, 5, 10, 15, whatever number of uh, duplicates you have of that piece of content. And uh, then there's this big word called canonicalization, which the Google engineers love to use. and uh, uh, just basically it refers to which page is definitive or the original source, the, the, the true original version. That's the canonical version. So now on to uh, some more kind of geeky details, and then we'll get into less geeky stuff in just a minute. So if you're like overly geeked out at the moment, don't worry. We'll come back to Earth in just a moment. So uh, what makes a... a uh, a search engine spider kind of turn up its nose or give it uh, some indigestion <laughs> over your website. Well, we kind of talked about some of these things already, but um, you know, stop characters, these are the equal signs and ampersands. If you have too many of them in the URL, then that means it's a, there's a lot of complexity there, and uh, Google gets a little bit nervous about that, that they may end up getting the same page over and over again, but at differing URLs. Uh, so try to minimize the number of stop characters or have just a very clean search engine friendly URL that doesn't even have a question mark or ampersands or equal signs. That's, that's the ideal. Yep. So um, another thing to avoid is session IDs in your URL or user IDs in the URL. This creates um, unique URLs and, and lots and lots of duplicates. That's a bad thing. Unnecessary variables in your URLs. Like tracking parameters, for example, like source equals blog or source equals email newsletter or whatever. So those sorts of things create, again, duplicate content because they're multiple URLs leading to the same piece of content. Um, also avoid frames, avoid chains of redirects, like at one redirect right after another, after another, after another, lead, finally leading to a destination URL. Uh, Pop-ups and uh, navigation based in Flash, Java, JavaScript. And uh, also avoid returning a, a status code of 200 on error pages that are like file not found errors. Uh, you should actually return what's called a 404 status code. So if you, you might have heard of a 404. If you're not returning that status code to Google when it's a, it's a page not found, then Google's going to lose trust in your site. A lot of people don't realize that, that Google checks for this. They actually make up URLs on your website and go to pages that it knows cannot possibly exist. Right? So if I went to your website, like www.yourwebsite.com, whatever it is, slash ASDF, 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 and I just made up a, 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 a file name, right? And it didn't return a status code of 404, Google would figure that out and then would um, basically lose trust in, in your site. So definitely you want to follow some best practices here. And uh, if you look on the, in the little, uh, I don't know what color that is, salmon <laughs> uh, colored box over on the right-hand side, here's some quick tips. Like uh, 
pass parameters via cookies instead of in the URL whenever possible. Uh, like, you know, avoid putting tracking parameters in the, in the URL, or if you have to, uh, use the uh, hash symbol instead of a uh, question mark. Um, use uh, CSS for drop-down menus instead of JavaScript, you know, those sorts of tips that will help you make a search engine-friendly website that the spiders can navigate and crawl effectively. So uh, here's an example of a situation where you have really complex URLs and uh, Googlebot just doesn't like it. So uh, this um, is the cdw.com website and uh, uh, the uh, first click into the website, that page is in Google's cache in, in its database. Um, the, the Google cache, by the way, if you have a page that's in Google's index or database and uh, Google then stores a copy of it, that's what they call their cache, their cached copy or stored copy of a web page. So if you ever go into the uh, Google search results and you find that, oh, here's something I really wanted to read, it's a really interesting piece of content, article, whatever, and then you, you follow the link and it, it says, oops, page is no longer available for whatever reason, like, darn it, I really wanted to read that. Just hit the back button, go back to the Google search results, then click uh, to, to view the preview of that uh, search result, so the little um, arrow uh, on the right-hand side of the, of the search listing, and then you'll see a cached link there, and click on that cached link. That'll show you the version of the page that Google grabbed the last time it visited the, the, that web page. So you can still read the piece of content, even though it's been pulled off of the website or is no longer available. That's pretty cool. So avoid really complex URLs because it may not end up getting into Google's database. In that case, there was CDW two clicks in, and uh, that page that I um, that URL that I specified wasn't uh, available in Google's cache. Now um, canonicalization I mentioned already. Here's a quick example of how things can kind of go awry with regards to canonicalization. If you have um, www. whatever your website is. com and uh, your website. com without the www and both of them lead to the same home page, one doesn't redirect to the other, then you can end up with um, canonicalization issues and and uh, the search engines can mistakenly see that as duplicate content that these are two copies. Uh, the, basically the sim similar or sim the same content, but at different URLs. So you want to aggregate um, all that link authority that's coming into both versions, the www version and the non-www version, because, you know, face it, people are lazy, when, especially online, bloggers and so forth who link to you may leave off the www, and if they do, then you want that link to count as well as if it, just as if it was going to www.yourwebsite.com. So the canonical tag is a great way to solve this issue or a 301 redirect. So there are two types of redirects, and I don't want to get into too much uh, detail here, but uh, 301 and 302, make sure that it's a 301 because that's what passes page rank or link authority uh, if you if it's set up as a 302, you're not going to get credit from Google. Uh, so make sure it's the right kind of redirect. Or use the canonical tag, which is a really easy piece of cake thing to do. Just it's one line of code added into your HTML, and boom, Google figures out what the correct canonical version of your web page is. All right, and then there's also other geeky stuff like robots.txt, which I'm not really going to go into. Uh, it's not essential that you have a robots.txt, but it is best practice that you do. And you can put in a sitemap uh, uh, directive in there that says this is where my XML sitemap is. That's uh, useful for auto discovery is what they call it, uh, so they, that Google can find your um, XML sitemap without having to dig around. And I'm going to skip over this slide and talk to you about XML sitemaps since I, I just uh, broached that subject. So an XML sitemap, simply put, is just a big long list of uh, your URLs of your website. And uh, you can also add additional information 
like your, the priority of each of these web pages. It's not going to give the, each page additional link authority because link authority comes from people linking to your pages, including yourself, uh, linking to your own pages. But um, yeah, so it's, it helps Googlebot determine how often it's going to re-spider or re recrawl each page if you specify a priority in, in the uh, XML sitemaps for each of these URLs. But it just gives Google and the other engines a nice list of all your web pages so that it, it knows that it's gotten everything. It, you know, like I said, it's not going to give you this. It's not a magic bullet uh, for having a really search engine unfriendly website. But it's, it is best practice to do it. So, uh, so I would do it. All right, so now on to the next phase in the process. So we got kind of the underlying plumbing uh, taken care of in, ter in terms of making sure that the Googlebot spider can navigate around your website and, and get the content. We need to get these pages more visible in the search results now. So there, there are literally hundreds of signals that influence your search engine rankings. Um, I'll, I'll just outline a, a handful of the more important ones. Um, uh, and and I, I break it down into two major categories, on-page factors and off-page factors. So the on-page factors would be things that are actually affecting the, the, the rankings that are on the page itself. And when I say on the page, it's not necessarily visible in, in the, on the rendered page that you see, but when you go to view source, so under the, you know, you go file, edit, view, and then you go view and, and page source or view source in your web browser, and then I'll show you a bunch of HTML code. That's what the spiders are, are seeing, quote unquote. And uh, if you have a good title tag in there, that's important. If you have good body copy in there, that's important and so forth, right? So it's, it's parsing through the HTML code looking for uh, signals that will help it determine whether your page is relevant and um, useful to the user. So the title tag is the most important of the on-page factors, so the things that are on the page. The off-page factors would be things that influence the page. They're not in the HTML of the page you're looking at. They might be on uh, other pages on the web that influence the rankings of the page in question. Like, for example, if people link to uh, the page in question, then that will influence its rankings. The anchor text, the underlying words that they use, that will influence the rankings because if they're using like the word click here, they're telling the search engines, hey, this page over here is about click here. Whereas if they use good keywords, uh, you know, you're trying to rank for blue widgets and they put blue widgets in the underlying words as the anchor text, then that's going to help Google to figure out that, hey, this page is all about blue widgets. So those are off-page factors. All right, now the home page is the most important page of your website typically, so you will really want to make most use of that. Most people link to your home page. They're not linking to your contact us page or the, your about us page, they're linking to your home page. So definitely take advantage of that. It has the most link authority. Every page of your site has a song to sing. Um, I mentioned this already that. Um, if you have a 500 page website, that's 500 opportunities. Uh, you could go after different keywords with each one of those 500 pages. You want to incorporate the keywords that you're targeting for that particular page into the title tag, into anchor text of, of uh, uh, links pointing to that page, like on other pages of your site, in, in your headings or headlines, like H1 or H2 tags, in the body copy, and high up in the body copy, that's called keyword prominence. That's where it's going to get given more weight, right? So if you say, um, oh, this page, uh, you know, blah, 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 I uh, forgot to tell you, um, it was all about blue widgets. Well, if that's in the last sentence of the page, that's not really going to help you rank for blue widgets like if you led with uh, in the first paragraph, you know, hey, this page is all about blue widgets, let me tell you about them. You want to have a clean and, and uh, concise HTML code when possible. Uh, don't rely on, H on uh, meta tags to help your rankings because they won't. <laughs> the meta keywords is absolutely useless and never has been a, a signal for Google. 
could get you in trouble because if you uh, you keyword stuff them at a keywords tag with a whole mess of keywords, Google's going to look at you pretty askance, but it's not going to help you and it never had. Uh, meta descriptions won't help your rankings either. They'll just help you with uh, your the, the snippet that's displayed, which could improve your, your click-through rate on, on the search results, so that's not a bad thing, but don't expect that meta tags will help your rankings typically. Um, I mean, there, there are exceptions if you have um, issues with uh, um, spidering and, and uh, indexation and so forth, and you use a meta robots tag, but that's um, that's a side uh, issue, right? Uh, meta keywords, meta descriptions aren't going to help your rankings. Uh, have text links for your navigation, not graphics, uh, whenever possible, right? So not graphical buttons, but actual text links, because uh, the text gets associated with the page that you're linking to. Uh, so you know those are kind of the quick and dirty major tips for making a, uh, uh, a set of search engine uh, friendly web pages. Um, so, you know, the meaningful uh, page titles, that's the most important, uh, good keyword rich, starting with the, the keywords rather than at the very end. Um, so don't have like welcome to our website, uh, make yourself comfortable blue widgets because <laughs> that's not a very good title. Starting off with blue widgets is, is better. And um, what else do I want to say about uh, titles? Yeah, so you can end up with, uh, here's an example of really not so good titles. Uh, terrible. <laughs> Look at that, un untitled document. That's, that's a missed opportunity if I've ever seen one. And then you can have duplicate title tags, which is also bad if you have the same title tag repeated on, across a whole swath of pages. Uh, don't do that either. And then um, a little trick here, if you want to see what is text versus what is graphics on a web page, because of course text is better. If, you, if you're on a PC, hit Control A. If you're on a Mac, hit Command A. And that will highlight everything on uh, the page. And you can see visually, it, it distinguishes between graphics and text so that you can see the difference, right? So I'm wondering if, for example, all the left nav items are text or graphics. Well, hit Control A on a PC or Command A on a Mac and watch what happens uh, to uh, uh, all those nav links over on the left-hand side, they definitely look like text, right? They don't look like, uh, like graphical buttons. And you can even highlight parts of words and make doubly sure that that's text. We definitely want text whenever possible. And uh, I already mentioned meta descriptions and meta keywords. Don't spam uh, Google by keyword stuffing. Lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of keywords in things like meta uh, tags or in body copy and so forth. Google looks for that sort of uh, dirty stuff. All right, try to keep uh, your code clean and, and you know if that will not only be good from an SEO standpoint, it's not like a huge signal having clean. Uh, HTML code, but what is a signal that uh, Google has, has gone on record to say is page speed. If you have a fast loading web page, you're going to do better in the Google search results, and even more importantly, your conversion rate will be better. You'll get more people following through to purchase on your website if you have a fast loading website. So cut out all the extraneous junk out of your HTML and optimize your images, minify your CSS and JavaScript, and all that sort of good stuff that will make your website uh, fast loading. All right, so uh, avoid um, Ajax and Flash for important content and, and navigation and so forth that you want the spiders to see. Um, okay, so that's... Uh, Step two, and then on to step three, building links in PageRank. So I talked uh, already a bit about this, that we want to build uh, link authority 
And it's not just about getting more links, it's about getting better links, more important links. So a link from CNN is better than a link from Jim Bob's personal homepage, right? So we definitely want to think in terms of quality of the links as well as the quantity. Um, and then Google has this measure they call PageRank, I alluded to already, named after Larry Page, co-founder of Google. It is a weighted form of link popularity, so it's not just taking into account the numbers of links, but also the quality of those links. And uh, Bing also has a similar measure for um, to, to PageRank. And then um, you can use a, uh, a, a tool called Open Site Explorer, which will give you an approximation of PageRank score and it's actually pretty uh, pretty useful uh, tool, and, and, and uh, this MozRank metric is pretty interesting uh, metric to watch, as well as the, the PageRank metric that you'll get from the Google Toolbar. Um, bear in mind that PageRank and MozRank, for that matter, are, are lo logarithmic in scale, so here you can kind of see what that means, that going from, let's say, a, a 1 to a 2 in PageRank is like uh, walking from, you know, here just one step and then going from, let's say, a 7 to an 8 might be from, you know, the distance from here to the sun sort of thing, right? So a massive, massive difference, logarithmic difference in, uh, in, in scale here uh, as you get closer to 10. The gaps between the integer become lo logarithmically larger. So if you have a page rank 7, that's actually pretty impressive if you looked at that, uh, that little mountain graph that I had up on the screen. Um, so we want to build links, and I would love to go into detail about how to do that, how to actually convince people to link to you, to you and so forth, but that's a topic for a whole other webinar. So uh, stay tuned, I might do one on that. And then you want to leverage your page rank so that you actually get people to your, your um, um, most important pages of your site, even though they may only be linking primarily to your home page you have your top selling products and your, your highest margin products and, and, and services and so forth, and you want those to rank. How do you get them to rank? Well, link to them from your homepage would be the simple short answer. All right, so the closer they are to the top of your site tree, the fewer clicks away from the homepage, the better you're going to do because the more page rank you're transferring uh, onto that page. So if you have a deep deep, deep in your website, like I have to click seven uh, times to get into a product page, that page doesn't stand a chance. So it's really leveraging your page rank is, is how you spend that link authority that tends to accumulate on your home page through your internal linking structure, like your breadcrumb navigation, your, your top nav, your footer nav, all that sort of stuff. And... Um, yeah, so you can end up with a pretty severe page rank dilution if you haven't done an effective job of this internal linking. If, for example, you put tracking parameters in your your URLs and the links, let's say that you have a header or a top navigation and a footer navigation, and one of them you you put and in, in the change the URL slightly and say source equals header nav. Uh, and then uh, on, on the footer link version of that link, it's uh, got uh, you know, question mark uh, source equals footer nav. Now you've created two different URLs for the same piece of content, and Google may get confused and index those separately, and you're splitting your page rank and so forth. So uh, danger, danger, Will Robinson. Okay, so... Um, after we've kind of fixed the uh, canonicalization and duplicate con content issues and so forth, um, then we can move on to, to encouraging click-through. And if funny enough, uh, even uh, some of Google's own sites struggle with uh, uh, duplicate content and, and canonicalization issues. I won't go into detail on that since we need to keep to time here. Um, but Encouraging click-through, getting people to click on your search listing over your competitors. Uh, it's just having something really compelling in the title and in the snippet that's, uh, and even the URL. So a shorter URL tends to get more clicks than a long URL. So uh, this is kind of a second-order activity. I would focus more on the rankings first and then on optimizing for uh, a, a better-looking 
title and snippet. But do bear in mind that uh, the click-through rate just falls off precipitously if from number one to number ten. It's just a, you know like falling off a cliff. And and similarly, just even the eye tracking studies show that people don't even look past uh, you know the third or fourth or fifth listing. Uh, or if they do, they only might look at, scan at the first word or so of that search listing and not see that you've mentioned free shipping at the end of the title. Uh, tag uh, on, on that listing, and then uh, finally, uh, getting to the to the tail end here. Uh, so we want to track the right metrics, and that means that uh, we need to. Well, we can't improve what we can't measure, or at least not reliably and reproducibly, right? So we need to track the right metrics. And those could include things like our indexation numbers, which we talked about, right? And using the site colon uh, query operator, or using uh, Google Webmaster Tools, uh, checking your link popularity, seeing how many people link to to your website, and tracking your page rank score and your Moz rank score over time, and seeing how that's improving and so forth as you're doing your link building and getting people to link to you. Um, tracking your rankings. Uh, there's a tool called Authority Labs, uh, which is really good for tracking your rankings, authoritylabs.com. Uh, keyword popularity, using those keyword research tools that I talked to you about, Google AdWords keyword tool and so forth. Uh, and of course, uh, tracking through like Google Analytics or whatever your analytics package is, um, the conversions and sales and, and, and so forth, cost per lead, et cetera, et cetera, right? All the kind of bottom line metrics. But then beyond that, there's a whole other set of metrics if you want to get more advanced. And again, this could be the topic for a whole other s seminar. Um, things like um, oh, uh, uh, alternative trust and authority metrics and, and uh, um, page yield and keyword yield and brand to non-brand ratio and index to crawl ratio and unique pages uh, crawled. And just, uh, there's a ton of things, right? Again, don't have time to cover this, but I will point you in the direction of an article which uh, gives you some more detail about some of these um, lesser known SEO metrics. So I've, I've listed that here. It's at practicallycommerce.com, an article I, I wrote uh, a while back uh, detailing what each of these metrics means in, in further detail. I encourage you to, to check that out. And then last, uh, we, we, we want to avoid the uh, worst practices and follow the best practices. So we want to target, and this is kind of just a recap of what we've all been talking about for the past hour, targeting relevant keywords, not irrelevant ones. We don't want to target the term Britney Spears just because she's popular on Google, right? So uh, unless you're selling uh, her albums, <laughs> right? We don't want to stuff keywords uh, all over the place, like into the meta tags and so forth. We don't want to conceal or hide um, links in, in the pages so that users don't see them, but only the search engine spiders do. We don't uh, do one of those sort of manipulative tactics that uh, we would be embarrassed to show a, a Google engineer, right? Because that will that will bite you in the in the butt at some point. Uh, a competitor will turn you in because there is a place in Google Webmaster turn, uh, tools where you can actually dob in a competitor uh, for spamming or for buying links. Right? So don't buy links either. You know, that's that's very tempting as well. <laughs> so a competitor can actually turn you in for that as, as well. There's just a ton of different things that would be dodgy. I'm not going to go into them because you shouldn't be doing them. So I'm not going to teach you what they all are. But suffice it to say, if you're doing anything that you feel that you would be embarrassed to show a Google engineer, a Google employee, don't do it. Stop doing it if you're already doing it. You know, clean it up because it may already be costing you a, a penalty in, in Google. So, um, and, and no site is immune, no brand, even BMW, huge respected brand, got slammed by Google. They were doing dodgy uh, tricks to, to Google, uh, providing keyword stuffed doorway pages that were just like, you know, 
uh, we have cars. Would you like some cars? Cars are what we do. We love cars. We have fast cars and lots of cars. And so, you know, that sort of garbage, not useful to users. And they tried to hide that content from the users. So when the user got into the page, uh, they didn't get that nonsense. They instead got uh, it's what's called a sneaky redirect. <laughs> they they got sent to a, a landing page that looked all pretty. So it was a real bait and switch tactic. And and when Google found out, they banned BMW Germany from the, the BMW.de site from Google's index. You don't want that, trust me. Um, so in summary, we want to. Uh, Focus on the best practices, avoid the worst practices, have uh, you know, the right keywords in mind, weave those keywords into the important places like the, the titles and the, the body copy, high up in the body copy. We want to build links, having great compelling content and building reputation and social media and so forth. Again, wish we could have had a whole other hour to go into link building, save that for another time. Um, we'll, then spend that page rank that we've earned through getting good links in very wisely and strategically within the site through our internal linking structure. We'll measure the right things with the right SEO metrics, and then continually monitor, benchmark, and test to make sure that we're continually improving. So that is SEO in a nutshell. <laughs> And of course, uh, I encourage you to uh, check out The Art of SEO if you want uh, a huge primer on the topic. It's 600 and some pages of, uh, uh, of knowledge about uh, SEO. But you know, it just start, you kind of a bite at a time, right? So you can only eat an elephant one bite at a time. So start with just like a few things that you're going to do that you've learned from this webinar and get them done within the next week, you know, or, or, or by the weekend, you know, so just like, oh, I'm going to, I'm going to come up with a better title tag for my homepage, or I'm going to add some more body copy to my homepage because it's all graphics and I really, now I understand I need to have some text there too for the search engine spiders to sink their teeth into. But just a few simple tasks and, and you'll start to move the needle and you'll get that positive reinforcement reward and then you'll go from there. Um, I also, for those of you who have stuck it around to the very end, uh, congratulations, you're going to get a copy of my PowerPoint slide deck. So um, uh, send an email to my assistant. Her uh, address is admin at stephanspencer.com. And uh, you'll get a copy of the PowerPoint deck as well as an SEO best and worst practices checklist and white paper. So both of those for free. Uh, just send an email to admin at stephanspencer.com. If you have any questions, I know we kind of ran out of time here for Q&A. We might take uh, one or two quick questions, but uh, you know, I'm, I'm sure there are more questions than that. So uh, feel free to send me an email. If you have a burning question, I'm, I'm happy to entertain it. So uh, stefan at stephanspencer.com to reach me directly. All right, so that is SEO in a nutshell. <laughs> Oh, fantastic, Stefan. What an outstanding presentation you gave our audience today. We do have just a couple minutes remaining. If you would like to take one or two questions um, in that Q&A tab, I don't know if you can see it. We did put some questions in there. If there's one or two you know, that you could answer pretty quickly, I'm sure the audience would be thrilled. Yep, absolutely. So um, uh, if you need to use Learn More for a link, um, uh, kind of what's the best practice there? Well, Google only counts the first link that it finds to a particular uh, page of content, uh, to a particular URL on that page. So if you link twice, uh, one of them says learn more and the other one has like the name of the product or, or article or whatever, have the name of the article uh, be the first link that Google finds. So make it above in the HTML the, the learn more link. Okay, so there's uh, there's a quick answer for that one. Um, so what's the problem with the JavaScript uh, navigation method? So if you turn off JavaScript in your browser and you hit re refresh or reload in, in your browser and the navigation stops working, that's a problem because Google does not execute JavaScript reliably. Sometimes it does, but in most cases it does a terrible job of it. So you do not want to rely on, on JavaScript in order for your, your navigation to function. 
And we'll take one more quick one. Um, what about .htm versus .aspx pages or you know other extensions like .php, et cetera? Does that matter? Or should it be a slash? Should it be a .htm or .html or whatever? No, nope, doesn't matter. Uh, a shorter URL is better because it, you get more clicks. Like Marketing Sherpa did a study and found that twice as many uh, uh, clicks happen on short URLs than long URLs in the, in the Google search results. So if you can shorten it by having a nice, clean, keyword-rich URL, and, and by the way, I didn't mention this, but try to have hyphens separating the keywords and not underscores because Google doesn't treat underscores as word separators. So if you have blue underscore widgets.htm, that's not nearly as good as blue hyphen widgets.htm.